All right, greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Nathan Croft. Pleased to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is some information that I think is very important to you moving out into the world as entrepreneurs about machine learning and artificial intelligence and how it has been transforming the industry. Um, so currently, I'm the director of a machine learning research lab called uh, New Sci Labs. Um, and essentially what we do is we partner with uh, government agencies, public sector, and we try and help them optimize what they're doing with uh, the help of AI. So we call ourselves uh, AI for good is what we like to do to try and uh, mitigate some of the negative media that we've all seen around the AI hype currently. Um, so as I'm going through this talk, I would very much appreciate it if it was pedagogical with my uh, you know, interactivity with you guys. So ask a lot of questions back and forth. And apparently I'm going to be throwing things at you when you have questions. So that's always exciting. The moment you want me to throw something, just ask a question. And then that's what's going to happen, all right? Um, so you, you've probably heard this talk about how machine learning is the new electricity, right? So what exactly do they mean by that? Well, I might not completely agree with it. I think it's a good point to communicate the message behind it. So, you know, a long time ago, Benjamin Franklin's flying some kites, trying to experiment with this notion of electricity, 1752. Um, and he comes up with the initial hypotheses behind, you know, electricity, positive, negative. What are these things? Uh, how does this work? Um, and then we have Michael Faraday, 1831, he discovers uh, magnetism, electromagnetism. So we now have coupled magnetism with electricity. Well, technically it was a little bit after Faraday uh, when that happened. But, um, and then, you know, now today, we've got these giant generators. And this is basically, this is the prototype of this. <laughs> All right, so that's basically what this giant machine is. It's a, just an optimized, amazing version of that. And so what has electricity done, right? Well, we all, we're all pretty aware of what it's done. It's completely revolutionized our infrastructure. All the big companies and the smart money people, they jump all the way over here and they say, well, as a business person, what do I want to do? Well, I want to own the thing that everybody wants and needs, right? That's pretty much one of the name of the games here. Um, so being all the way he over here on this side is the great place to be because you've now fueled pretty much everything all the way down the distribution line to the consumers and domestic uh, people on that side. So how does this relate to machine learning and how is ML, quote unquote, some sort of a new electricity? You know, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think it's a good analogy for sort of understanding the scope and the impact that it's been having. So, uh, you know, where AI started is sort of murky. Uh, you know, all the way back in 1737, there was this guy, Jacques Jacques Van, Van Ku something, um, and he would make these little robots that were just made out of gears that emulated things that seemed like biological life. And so basically everybody believed that a biological life was somehow governed by these like mechanisms and gears. And so we were just a manifestation of a sophisticated interaction of these things. And you had the little guy who played music and you had the little duck that walked around and it would like lay an egg and everybody's like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And so this was AI, right? This is kind of like Benjamin Franklin flying a kite. All right, but 1997, let's go forward, you know, 200 years, and we have uh, Gary Kasparov losing to Deep Blue, right? When IBM made this big supercomputer that beat him, and the whole world was like, oh no. Computers are smarter than humans. It's the end of the world. Gary Kasparov was renowned as one of the smartest men of our time, right? Uh, and so the computer beat him and everybody, everyone got scared. And nowadays, today, you know, you can have the small little desktop computer in your home with four powerful GPUs that's orders of magnitude more powerful than Deep Blue was. Uh, and you can do deep learning computation on your desktop, right? And so when you think about the electricity companies fueling the economy and the industries, well, how does that work with AI? Well, you'd think the big AI companies are sort of fueling the computation and the machine learning that's taking place in reality, right? And it's not quite, it's not quite there. You know, that might happen and we might be going in that direction. You know, personally at Newsnet, we've spent $20,000 or more just in you know, cloud computing resources um, just in the past year of trying to do some of our machine learning stuff. And we may become more dependent on it depending on how the market changes. Um, but you know, as of last year, only about 3% of, of uh, the actual industry partners uh, that were doing ML were relying solely on the services that were offered by these, these titans. What they were doing is a lot of this. And so this may change, but this is pretty much it. Right? So data scientists to the rescue. Um, this is some 82% of the market in 2018. Um, uh, the company would be hiring individuals to come in and create their own data science teams to understand their problems. What is it in their company that they can optimize? How do they go about doing that? 
They want to, to, to generate reports and communicate things inside of the companies and the businesses. And you need something more personal than just some cloud-based distribution of AI tools because a lot of people don't even know what those tools are or how they work, right? You need experts to come in-house and really understand your problems for you. So this is what it's, what it's looked like as of maybe last year. Things are changing a little bit, but this is a good perspective of the market as of, as of now. All right, so how, what, is the, what does this look like throughout the rest of the world, right? Let's take a, actually, I'm gonna use this as a little excuse to give you uh, a statistics education, right? So all of you guys, you're gonna go out in the world and be fancy business people, and people are gonna come at you and show you their pie charts and their statistics and try and convince you of all these things like charlatans, and you're gonna look at this, and so you're gonna see this, and you're gonna ask me what? I'm trying to sell you something, so what are you asking me about this? Who wants a box? Sure. So I'm trying to say, uh, so all of the AI companies out in the world, this is their distribution across, uh, across the world, right? And so I'm trying to convince you that this is true. So what's the first thing that you ask me when you look at this? Um, where are you getting your data from? And like, where's, where are your surveys? How do you Very get good. this information? Excellent, excellent question. Okay, so I go, oh, well, uh, I got it from the, uh, the AI and Strata Data Conference um, from O'Reilly. This was last year's information, okay? Is that convincing? Are you convinced yet? What, so what else do you ask? Who did you ask? Very good, right? Otherwise, the data could be biased. In particular, where was this conference held at, right? If it was held, for example, in New York, which is where it was held, is it tremendously surprising that a significant portion of these people are from North America? Probably not. Right? <coughs> so, you know, that being said, this is still some of the best statistics that, we, that I could find on the matter anyways, but you always want to be very suspicious about statistics. They're incredibly easy to misinterpret. Did you know 95% of shark attacks happen in shallow water? You gotta stop going to the beach, right? No, that's just because that's where all the people are. Sharks aren't gonna attack people in deep water because there's no people out there, right? So it's really easy to misinterpret statistics, so be very careful about that, especially when you go out into a, the business world. They're gonna try and pull the, pull the wool over your eyes. Um, so we see that you know, North America is leading the stage as of last year. Um, not tremendously surprising as AI was more or less born in Toronto and Canada and really trickled down over into the California, Berkeley area as well as New York University. Um, so then they say, okay, well, now that we know uh, what's going on, let's see sort of who's exploring versus who are some early adopters and who are really sophisticated with this right now. Um, and as of last year, about half of the people that are quote unquote AI, an AI business, they're just exploring, they're trying to learn, seeing what's going on. No doubt, they, this is no, no wonder they can't go to just Google and, and use their services right away. They don't even know how this stuff works. They don't even know how to integrate it into their business, which is what you're going to learn from me today. Um, and then they, they went ahead and just took a, a look at the breakdown there, which is not as relevant here. Um, and once again, you know, you get a little bit of a further breakdown, right? And so this is, this is responsible statistics, right? You always want to look at the breakdown, go deeper and deeper, and so you ask these questions, well, North America, okay, well, how much within North America are early adopters, et cetera, versus just looking? And you see that North America as well has some of the most sophisticated use in machine learning, um, leading with Western Europe as well. <laughs> Okay, so it's just a look at the lay of the land to get an idea um, when you're trying to make some, um, some executive decisions. All right, so one of the most important things is being able to communicate, okay? So if you're gonna go into the business world anytime nowadays, you need to know the basics of machine learning because it's transforming the field. And if you go out there oblivious to this technology, you're not gonna get very far, okay? So you need to be able to communicate. And so I'm just gonna show you some of the absolute basic concepts, some of the verbiage that you're gonna hear and I'm gonna paint a picture in your mind so that you can at least just communicate with these people. You should always have a super certified data scientist by your side to try and you know, wade you through all the BS that people are gonna try and throw at you. The AI hype right now is real and there's uh, all kinds of tomfoolery and charlatans out there. So, but you need to at least know the basics to communicate, okay? So the best place to start is a definition, all right? So there's no completely accepted definition, but a lot of the practitioners accept the definition uh, from Mitchell, he came out with in 1997. So a computer program is said to learn from experience, call it E, with respect to some class of tasks, call it T, and a performance measure P if it gets better at doing that task as it gets more data, as measured by that performance measure. Okay? It's a pretty reasonable definition. 
It turns out it's surprisingly robust to uh, a lot of the classes of AI that have been, or machine learning that have been uh, developed recently, okay? So whenever anybody talks to you about machine learning or AI, these are the three things that you want to wonder about. Most importantly, you're going to care about this right here, experience, because what that's called is that's data. All right, and so that's going to be a recurring theme that I'm going to start trying to uh, pull the curtain back on a little bit more and more as we continue. So basically, you're going to say to yourself, oh, machine learning, some algorithm, what are we trying to do? Well, first thing is, what is the thing that we're trying to do? What is the task we want to do? Okay, well, how do you measure how well that task is done? And then secondly, you're going to say, well, how do we improve on that task? What sort of data do you have that we can learn from? Okay, these are the things that you want to think about. So, some of these examples that I might give you, tasks, what are, what are tasks? Classification, for example. Maybe you have, uh, you're in some medical company and you wanna classify patients as at risk or not, some sort of medical diagnosis, right? So you're gonna take a bunch of variables that, that they use to measure this person, age, height, weight, et cetera, and you wanna try and classify or predict whether they're at risk or not for you to go market to them to try and give them some, some medicine. Transcription, right? This is really important. So speech to text is a huge thing currently. We employ a lot of it actually um, at NewSci, and I'll tell you a fun little story about the conference I went to recently involving that. Anomaly detection is huge. Um, in fact, at the conference we were at, people also asked us about some contacts that we can do with them for anomaly detection. We thank all of our credit card companies for that, right? Saving us from credit card fraud. You get a text and some guy in you know, Ukraine or wherever is uh, you know, having, having a field day with your credit card. Um, and then Genesis is synthesizing some actual new um, uh, data. We'll talk about that. So performance, this is really, really difficult to choose. And it's actually a pretty active area of machine learning research. We're not going to go too much into it, but just know that from a business executive perspective, you always want to be curious about what is specifically the thing that you're agreeing to. And a lot of our contracts, when people say to us, ah, well, we would like you to help us improve this. Okay, well, in the contract, if you're going to agree that we've succeeded at this task, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to succeed at this task? You want a very clearly defined measure or metric of performance. You know, so when we go to them, I go, ah, well, here's your data set of 100,000 images, and I have just classified them 87% correctly, which is what we had in our uh, contract, so we have succeeded at this. Very important is a performance metric. And then most important of all is going to be the experience and the data, and this is what matters most to you as entrepreneurs going out. All right, so this, you know, this, is, this is always changing. Uh, I threw transfer learning in there recently. It isn't really its own field. It's sort of like uh, it subsumes all of these, but it, these are a lot of the buzzwords that you're going to hear, and it's important to know what these are about. So supervised learning requires labels. Right? So if you want someone to do something that has labels, data has been labeled, they're doing a supervised learning task. Transfer learning also can employ labels. You're trying to take something you learned from one task and transfer the fundamental knowledge to another task. If I show you a bunch of cars, for example, and I tell you they're used for transportation, and now you see a bicycle, and you've never seen it before in your life, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go, hmm, well, it has wheels. Cars have wheels. Cars are used for transportation. Maybe this thing, too, is used for transportation. Okay, that's called transfer learning. You're transferring something you've learned from one problem to another. Um, unsupervised learning is a little bit more difficult. That's where you have no labels. You're just trying to extract information from a data set. I mean, this is basically what infants do, babies. You know, you're seeing a bunch of sensory information and your brain is slowly learning how to transform this data into things that you can operate on internally. It's learning to cluster and identify things on its own. And then reinforcement learning. Uh, we won't get into that yet. All right, so how does this stuff work? Um, essentially, you can think of it as neurons that are observing data and partitioning data sets, all right? So basically all the way over here, you've got some neurons that are learning something about the data that you're looking at, and then it's sending the information that it's received into some bigger picture so you can see the lay of the land. All right, so this is just, think of data points on plots and think of sort of partitioning and clustering these data points uh, depending on the task you're trying to accomplish. And this is, of course, inspired by the visual cortex, and this is a drawing from Ramoni Cajal. Uh, won the Nobel Prize, one of the leaders of neuroscience, and uh, you know, it's a champion favorite of mine. Um, and this is basically the structure of the visual cortex um, and with a lot of neurons. And you can see the stratification in the layers. This is actually what inspired a particular type of neural network called the convolutional neural network. Okay? So um, it's just inspired by neurons. We don't want to go too much into machine learning theory today. And so here's, for example, how a convolutional network would work. You take an input image, 
and then you sort of hierarchically start decomposing it in those layers, that stratification that you saw in the uh, image from the visual cortex. And so they go, well, if that's how the brain does it, maybe we can do this in neurons as well. And then finally up here, this huge vector we use to classify this as a seven. Right? So all the features have been extracted, edges and corners, and this thing now encodes the number seven. Right? It's kind of neat to see a little bit of look at that. Right, but what matters for you as an executive, you're not a machine learning scientist, you know, it's good to take a look under the hood every once in a while, it never hurts, the more knowledge the better, but you think about supervised learning tasks as basically implications, right? You have something, A, and you'd like to teach it to do something B every time A, a happens, right? Um, I'm gonna give you the year of a house and I want you to predict how much it costs. I'm going to give you an image and I want you to tell me if there's a dog in it. I'm gonna give you a question and I want you to tell me what the answer is, right? Supervised learning. And to do that, you need those labels. You need a, a collection of input and output pairs that you can learn from. Examples. Here's an image. Show me who's inside of it. Luke Skywalker, 94.5% certain about that. What about, what about being closer to this? What about uh, speech to text, right? So you say something and then you need an example of the text that comes out of it. So now you're basically saying input is an audio file, output is a bunch of text. A to B, supervised learning. You could also use this for translation, right? A body of text A and I want to translate this too into a body of text B, going from English to Spanish. Same meaning from both things but different underlying um, uh, representations. Or what about optical character recognition? I'd like to take a picture of text and then turn it into actual text on a computer. Digitize the image, optical character recognition. Again, A to B. And then finally, maybe we combine all of these and make a cool app. Given an image, I'd like to identify whether there's a language in it. Okay, now that I've found the language, I'd like to use optical character recognition to extract it from the image. Okay, now I'd like to detect what language it was. Okay, now I'd like to translate that language into English. Okay, and now I'd like to present the results onto my, onto my phone. Okay? So now we're just stringing together a bunch of machine learning tasks. Nothing really super fancy here. All of these individual tasks are easy to understand, but when you put them all together, as you know, sufficiently advanced technology becomes indistinguishable, indistinguishable from magic. And this is kind of a neat trick, right? But now you can kind of see how that stuff works. All right, so now let's start talking a little bit about, I kept saying data is going to become important. This is really one of the messages I want to give you. Speech to text, right? We've all, we all talked to Siri or, or, you know, OK Google or Alexa, and it understands what you're saying, and that seems really magical, right? And it is a pretty impressive feat of engineering. But what's even more impressive to me is that the majority of these things and the way that they work, this is just implication, speech to text, required, oh, and here's the algorithm to do it, who cares? required about five years of audio, okay? So it, it took about five years for it to learn, five years, and it didn't take five years to learn, it took five years of speech, the equivalent of five years of audio in our human time to learn this, although we can pump it through much faster and speed up time for it to um, speed up processing, which is equivalent to speeding up our perception of time for it. Um, but 5,000 hours of audio for it to learn the, the stuff that you're using as of last year. And of course, this is always improving. What about natural language processing, right? So once it's understood the text, you want it to extract information from it. So for example, this was something that was discovered in word to vec not too long ago, where it turns out that the, the embedding space that it learns actually encodes semantic information. The algorithm learned that man is to woman what king is to queen. It extracted that from the usage of the words in the algorithm that we use for word embedding. You can also get verb tenses as well. It learned that as well, and then even translations. It, uh, or even relations, for example, capital cities and countries, China to Beijing, Vietnam to Hanoi. All of this comes from uh, word to vec And uh, the state of the art, for example, is called text-to-text -text transfer transformer. Right? And this is the T5 model that came out actually just a few weeks, a few months ago. Um, and this was trained on the entire Wikipedia database. Right? That's how much text, that's how much data it needed to learn these things. Okay? Lots and lots of data. All right, what about image processing? You know, we've all seen um, character uh, or uh, classification. This is a cat. We've seen object detection. And then we've seen instant segmentation. We've probably seen all these things in different formats. And you say to yourself, how do these machine learning algorithms learn to accomplish? So here's just a, a name of some of these buzzwords that you guys might want to just be aware of. These are all the latest and greatest uh, networks that everybody uses. 
Um, this was one of the first ones that came out. This is sort of, and actually this is exactly in important order, HRNet is one of the latest ones. And in fact, we employ HRNet at NUSAP for some of our products um, as well. It's a very, very powerful algorithm. Um, and so, yeah, these algorithms are all great and well and good, and they can do really cool things, but it's useless without data. It's kind of like buying a really nice car. It looks great, but unless you put fuel into it, it's not going to take you anywhere. Okay, so these algorithms are great in theory, but they mean nothing without the data. Patenting these algorithms is just a waste of money. I, that's one of the things that I keep trying to tell business people. It's, if you guys, the whole software, patenting software age is over, okay? It, it'll take you two years to patent one of these things, and six months after it was invented, it's already become obsolete because there's a better algorithm out there. The software and the algorithms is not where the money is at, okay? It's the data that powers them. That's where the money's at. What about image processing, right? As I was saying, this takes 14 million images to do these things. It took 14 million images as of 2012 to train those algorithms. That's a lot of images, yeah? Yeah, wait. So are you saying like every time then, because Facebook will recognize like a certain face and they can assign it to a certain profile, be like, this person, they can tell it's my face on any other person's photo. So is Facebook's algorithm learning my face to be like, every time they see this face, it is this person. And the more images that are uploaded of me with me tagged in it, then the more it will recognize that it is me in that photo. That's exactly correct. But the one important thing that you said is images that are uploaded with you tagged in it. Some human has to explicitly tag you as a label. If it predicts that it's you, it can't use that as a label because it doesn't know whether it's right or not, right? That's just part of the algorithm. It needs the external feedback from the users. And that's a very important point that I'm gonna actually talk about in the future. Okay, cool. So like if no one had ever tagged me and I never posted on Facebook ever of my face, then Facebook wouldn't know, basically? Kind in of. theory, yeah, that's, okay. that's the general premise. Exactly, very good. Right, so why is deep learning so successful? Well, I'm sure you're starting to suspect that this, this data thing has something to do with it, right? Well, traditional approaches to uh, AI way back in the day, you know, we, we do pretty reasonable performance as we get more data. Uh, so we go, oh, well, neural networks, these things can do so much better. This is great. They're able to harness the data that it has access to in a better way. And then finally, of course, the deep learning revolution has really changed things to the uh, to the next level, the larger the network, the more we're able to harness the information that, in, that is within the data. So data, 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 this starts to seem like a really important thing. All right, well now that we've understood that, this is gonna be one of the most important things that I'd like for you to take away. Once you've seen that this is taking place, we need to sort of incorporate it into how we think about businesses and, and corporate and, and agency and uh, corporate strategy. So this is the business model that I have been using and this is what has led to our success, and um, it's being duplicated and replicated by many other people that are leading in the AI field. So the number one thing that you want to do is create a prototype as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible, right? Because what the prototype does is it allows you to get users, right? As soon as you have people using your prototype, they're on, your, on the phone, they're on the computer, they're clicking around, they're doing something, they're, they have a device that's connected to the internet sending data, what are they doing? They are giving you data. Users give you labels, right? This is like you said, you use a human to upload a photo of you and click your name and label you in it, tag you in it. The, use, the user interaction, you devise your prototype and your model such that as users use it, you're extracting data from their use case. And what do you do with that data? You improve the model, right? Whatever your prototype was, didn't do so well because you only had a small example of data. So what you want to do is get this prototype out and get more data and improve your model. What happens with a better model? You get more users. More users, more data, more data, you can train it better, and so on and so forth. And this gives you a beautiful little synergistic circle that I encapsulated in this nice little picture to communicate this idea of succinctly to you, okay? So this is really how you want to think about corporate strategies in the machine learning uh, future that we're moving into. Let's take a look at some examples. So there were some graduate students, or I think they were even undergraduate students at Stanford, I believe. And they devised, they walked around through farms and they just took pictures of little heads of cabbage. Took a picture, took a picture, took a picture. And with every single one of those pictures, they would write down in a little notebook whether the cabbage head was good or bad. And so they collected a huge database of pictures of cabbage and associated with them a label of whether the head of cabbage was good or bad. And they called themselves Blue River Technology. 
And what they did is their algorithm was so good at automatically detecting whether a head of cabbage was good or bad, John Deere came along and said, wow, that's really valuable and really impressive. Um, I can just strap one of these algorithms onto these giant tractors and trucks and just drive around and automatically know which heads of cabbage to take out. So the farmers no longer have to go through and determine which heads of cabbage are good or bad, right? What a great business model. So John Deere goes, oh, maybe I'll go create one of these algorithms too. And they go, oh wait, I can't because I don't have all those pictures of heads of cabbage that they laboriously walked around and took pictures of and labeled for them. So John Deere, not wanting to waste time and really not interested in walking around through farmland, said, hey, I'll give you $305 million for your data set, which is exactly what happened. So if you want a lot of money, walk around and take pictures of vegetables. Okay? Oh my God. <laughs> what about these guys? Have you guys heard of them before? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right? So this is a, a local company and they're doing really well for themselves. And so you say to yourself, well, what, how could this company have anything to do with data? What's going on with that? Well, um, they put pictures of heads on socks, but how do they get that picture on the sock? Somebody somewhere at home uploads a picture to the internet, and it's just a random picture of them at a football game doing something obnoxious or someone's in the way, and they send this to a graphic designer. The graphic designer takes this image, and they very carefully crop the background, rotate the head, do some illumination changes to make it beautiful so that we can print it on the sock, right? And that works out perfectly well. And that was what they did for the first two years. And every single time they did this, they would take the original uploaded image, and then they would take the image that was put on the sock, and they would just put them in a database, and they would just keep all of this stuff, right? And now they have over 200,000 image pairs of uploaded images and then the nice crop to go on a sock, right? But as things start scaling, that business model doesn't scale very well, right? They have to wait about a day or two often for the graphic designers to, fi to, to finish cropping the photos. They literally have, they funded a new industry in India. There's like a new building where there's some 40 or 50 people and all the graphic designers do and crop these images for them. And they have to wait about a day or two before they can get the images back. Well, the problem is, is that traffic during high demand seasons, such as Christmas, et cetera, is really large and they get backed up to the extent that they have to stop accepting orders by like December 1st. Think about how much more business they could have had, how much more money they could have made if they could have continued accepting images. So the bottleneck is putting the face of the dog or a cat or human or horse or whatever else they've got, parrot, on a sock, or, uh, getting it from the image and getting the cropped version. That's their bottleneck, right? So enter AI, right? Uploaded image. Here's the output of uh, our HR net. We're, we're their AI client and we've developed this model for them. It trains in the cloud and every time somebody uploads an image, it comes directly to our AI model and we automatically crop out the head to go onto the sock, right? And so we've done this because we've seen 200,000 image pairs and we've trained some of the world's latest uh, vision models to be able to do pixel-wise classification. Is this pixel part of the face that's going on the sock or not? How does it know which pixel goes on the sock or doesn't? because it's seen over 200,000 examples, okay? So what was the benefit of Divya? It was keeping all of that data. The data is what's powerful. They don't care about the algorithm that we've created, right? The algorithm we've created, it's not worth anything because anybody else can take it. It's out there, it's, it's open source. What matters is the data that trains it, okay? The data is where the value is at. All right, so let's try to build a little intuition about how this works. So here's just some fun interactive examples for us to test our knowledge and see what we think. So let's say drugs. Drugs are fun, everybody loves drugs, okay? So we got some drugs, and we're a drug company, and we know people like drugs, and we're gonna leverage this to make some money. So we wanna make lots of drugs, and then we wanna give them to people and put them in people's hands. So the question is, how do we get the most drugs from the factory into people's hands? Well, we have to make sure that we don't give people bad drugs, because if we give people bad drugs, then we get sued and we lose them a lot of money and that's, that's pretty troublesome, right? So what we do is we say, well, since we're cranking them out of this giant machine, we need to somehow make sure that all these pills and everything that are coming out are okay. Well, how do we determine whether they're okay or not? Ah, well, let's hire a bunch of people to sit next to the conveyor belt and take a look at whether they're good or bad, okay? This is a great business model and in fact, this is what most Drug companies still do. We've seen them in videos and movies and everything, right? So, cool. Now you guys come along and they go, okay, help me optimize my business. What are you guys gonna do? Kind of maybe like the cabbage people and 
collect images of good pills and collect images of bad pills and be like, okay, if you see this bad pill algorithm, get rid of it and sort it into different, like maybe side goes left and then they're bad and have people be sorting through the bad ones just to make sure they're bad and through the good ones are good. I don't know. Yeah, I'm gonna hire you, exactly. That's exactly the, the, the I mean, I put this immediately after that example because this is like the first stepping stone. It's kind of a simple solution. We can kind of see it fall in pretty naturally. Filtering whether things are good or bad, that's great, and that's exactly the, the answer that I would think of. What else? What else can we do? Right? AI basically takes data and optimizes things. What do you think? Wait, I gotta throw something at you. Um, you could probably, if your data is like thorough enough, probably track the sourcing of those pills to see like if probably bad ones are coming from a certain like production center or something. Right. So maybe the ingredients. Right. So not only do we know which pills that are actually coming out are good or bad, but we know the ingredients that cause that batch. And so maybe we look at uh, you know ten year, ten months of data and we see that we changed providers of ingredients and over this three month period a whole bunch of bad pills came out and during this three month period there was we had data from or ingredients from this one company you know so that's a little data science and analysis to data analytics is what we call that's really trying to find that that's a good one uh, there's no right or wrong answer here i'm just sort of you know for being entrepreneurs so coming up with new ideas what do you think any other ideas all right let's give you a harder one so Parkinson's, that's no fun, okay? So this guy, he has Parkinson's, and he's having a tough time walking around. Quality of life is one of the best ways for you guys to make money. It's like one of the most valuable things to humans. As uh, Spanx lady, what's her name? <laughs> Sarah Blick, yeah, right? What did she do? She's like, here's some super random tight clothes that make you feel better about yourself, make you look better. It's a super simple business model that just leverages the human desire to improve their human condition, right? So great. Well, what if we have some way to improve the quality of life of Parkinson's patients, right? How might we go about that? Well, let's say, for example, that it came to your attention that there's a correlation between how far somebody's elbow swings with Parkinson's and whether they're gonna have a freeze of gait moment where their legs cuff and then they fall over on the ground and injuring themselves. So there's a correlation. Their elbow swing somehow decreases moments before they have a freeze of gait attack and fall. Okay, bam. And enter machine learning entrepreneurs. What are you guys gonna do to fix this and make a product to make some money? And, and not to make money, to improve the quality of life. <laughs> and then inadvertently make some money too if that happens to be the case. Well, can I ask you like a question? Uh, I was wondering, so when that happens, when the actions, when there's a change in like arm movement, is that um, something that can be like addressed with stimuli or is it just like a circuit ending and something like starting over? Like, is it something that you could use a device to notice that and like, I don't want to say shock the person, but like tell the person to fix it or? Maybe, I don't know. What are your ideas? I don't know, like. Let's throw, throw it back to her there. What do you, what do you got? Um, I was just thinking, like, maybe create, like, a, an alert system that would let, like, the family know that something's happening. Yes, like, the person might not kill um, himself, but you could, like, prevent something worse from happening. I don't Definitely, know. Definitely, but how do we, like, how do we know to alert them? Like, that's the question. Because wouldn't you be able to, like, um, recognize certain movements and like create an algorithm with that. But how could we, I mean, how do we measure their movements? How do we know that? Good question. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're on the right track. And this is the brainstorming you want to have, right? You start narrowing yeah. down in on how you can do these things. So yeah, we've all, we all agree that if we can identify that it's about to happen and notify someone, this is what we want. But how do we identify that, right? Uh, what if we had like a sleeve on the arm and then if we, we like, it recorded every, like every time the arm moved and then if it got into that parameter or that range of motion that like um, really like warrants of the attack that it could it could send an alert system if it happens I guess because it can like record the times that it goes through that motion and nothing happens and then it, rec it rec can record the time that it actually happens so it can like fine-tune 
like what certain cases it will happen. And then they can give alert to either the person, like a beeping to them, like to let them know, like to stop walking or to be more careful and then send alert to their family members, like she said, to check up on them or yeah. anything. Yeah, that's a little bit more refining and you would, have, you would have nailed it. So this is a thing and this idea, we did this research here at FSU, right? So uh, we've, and interestingly, as a random side, I teach tango and it turns out that we've done two studies now and it turns out that Argentine tango staves off the degenerative effect of Parkinson's to a significant, a statistically significant degree. We just published it in JNBA. So if you want to have a better quality of life, you should dance tango, okay? <laughs> and in parallel, while we were doing that study, we were measuring a lot of things, you know, they were walking across this gate right mat, they had some insoles in their shoes measuring things, and in particular, we were trying to measure their uh, elbow swing, right? And so, yeah, exactly. You put maybe a cell phone or a watch, something that has an accelerometer in it, and so you can sort of measure their standard swinging of their elbows. And what you can do is have a bunch of observations of when somebody had a freeze of gait moment, have hundreds of thousands of them, unfortunately, to learn from. And they're going to happen whether you measure them and observe them or not, so why not just observe them so you can start preventing them in the future, right? And then train an algorithm that says, as soon as their swing falls within this regime, Boom, exactly. Do one of the one of the million things, buzz their wrist, call someone, 911, make a beeping noise, you know, exactly. All of that stuff is like a paint job on the car, but the algorithm itself is the engine, right? The ability to detect it, the machine learning algorithm that detects it, okay? Yeah. An idea that came to mind was, could you use VR uh, modeling in VR and uh, study that VR uh, and um, use that as the data set for the algorithm? So that's an interesting question. Um, you may be interested to know that there's somebody at the University of Florida who's studying exactly that. They have found that there's also a correlation of freeze of gait and the visual stimulus that the Parkinson's patients are subjected to. So for example, when they're walking and then they suddenly create a box that appears right in front of them, their ability to sort of slow down and, and adapt is greatly diminished. And in fact, they have a freeze of gait and their, their elbow swing and everything declines as well. So, there may be a way to say, well, from this study, we've observed that if we can present something to their visual system, that it breaks that freeze of gait moment, allowing them to continue walking. So maybe they wear some, you know, Google Glass or something, and once the wristwatch detects that they're within some range, boom, it changes the, it changes the things that they see to help prevent them from falling. Yeah, that'd be a, that's an interesting idea. Exactly. Very good. Very good. Um, okay, so let's sort of kind of bring it to home now. So this is just an example that I like to show to sort of demonstrate how things have changed and how they should change. This is going to be an example that you know from beginning to end, and I'm going to have you use this as an intuitive example to see what I mean by the new machine learning era from beginning to end, okay? So internet era. All right, you have a store. These things have been around since as old as time, and people love them. Okay, so a store uh, plus the internet does not equal an internet company, okay? So what is an internet company? Well, if I have a, a store and then I just make a website for my store, I'm not an internet company, I'm a store that has a website, right? <laughs> so what, what makes an internet company? Well, an internet company is a company that designs around internet technologies. Fundamentally, their, their executive and corporate decisions are based on the technologies and the infrastructure that the internet provides. They have this thing called A-B testing, where maybe you're doing certain marketing to certain subs, uh, to sub, uh, subsets of, of your um, um, clients, like where maybe you'll demo a certain advertisement in the top corner to one client and then another advertisement to another group of clients, and you want to see who clicks on it more or less, and you collect all of this data, and then you make decisions, marketing and advertising decisions based off of these things, right? That's only possible with internet technologies, clicking and tracking, eye, track, eye tracking, et cetera. So the, and another thing is that strategic decisions, unfortunately, are not just made by the executives because executives don't know everything about the technology. And so good leaders identify the strengths and the knowledge of their, of their constituents and provide them opportunities that allow their strengths to flourish. And if you want to make some sort of a decision that's contingent upon internet technology, you want the wisest person about internet technology next to you to make that decision. Okay? So what's up with this machine learning here? Well, let's say I have a, you know, a big technology company and I include machine learning to it. So an, a technology company plus machine learning does not equal an AI company, right? That's, that's not how that works. It's kind of the same thing here. You say, well, a business plus the internet doesn't make an internet, uh, an internet company. If I'm a tech company and I just try to include AI, that doesn't make me an AI company. 
What makes you an AI company is that you have to do strategic data acquisition, right? Data is the fundamental key. You can't just slap a machine learning algorithm onto a business and now suddenly you're an AI company. No, an AI company strategically acquires data that uh, leverages things that they want to do. Not only that, but they have to have a lot of technology and an infrastructure underneath the, the data to support this, right? So your data, learning, your, your data scientists and machine learning engineers need to very quickly and readily access the data and subsets of the data and do analysis. This data is flowing back and forth between your data warehouse and it needs to be structured very efficiently. Everything that you can automate is automated, okay? This is basically one of the building blocks of a machine learning company, and I'll talk a little bit more about this maybe after we wrap it up and turn off the video, I'll show you guys some, uh, some cool stuff. Um, and then job description changes, okay? So if you guys heard of all these terms, data scientist, data engineer, data analyst, research scientist, we're just making these things up. I mean, what's in a name anyways? It, it only means something based off of everyone's collective imagination. And when we all agree that it means something, we use it to communicate. This, this is what words are. And these labels are the same thing. We're literally just inventing these things as we go along here. And to walk up and be like, oh, I need a data scientist. And you should say, what do you, don't give me a name. Tell me what you want. Like, because we don't know what these things mean yet, right? And so this is just a study that was done in 2018 about what everybody is calling all of their people. Like, these are people that are employed right now. You know, what are their jobs? I don't know. We're making this stuff up as we go. So these are things you should be aware of as well. So when someone says data scientist, data engineer, data analyst, be a little suspicious and always make sure that you ask for more information. All right, so the question is, you know, you see this, you need data and you wanna use data to automate and automation saves money and makes things better and puts people out of jobs, apparently. So the question is, sure. what should you automate, okay? This is, a, this is a really good rule of thumb. This isn't the answer, but this is a great place for you to start, to build intuition and to start understanding the market. Anything a human can do in less than a second of thought, we can basically automate. So if you have people sitting in a room or sitting next to a conveyor belt looking at different things, that's bad, that's good, that's bad, we can automate that. If you have people adding two numbers together, crunching numbers, we, you know, obviously we can do that. We can do anything that a human can do in just a second of thought, we can basically automate, okay? With, with exception, but it's a great rule of thumb for starting. So in a nutshell, I think, you know, I tried to paint this picture in a way that you can see the analogies and sort of understand the motivation that you can incorporate it more into your entrepreneurial efforts. But the most important things to take away, you know, the details I hope will hopefully uh, enable you to remember them, be remember them better. But the most important things are one, this awesome little figure that I made, uh, data. Oh, actually, I didn't update this one. I updated the other one. That's a lie. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, failure by me. That's uh, this. This is supposed to be uh, yeah, product. I know, users, yeah, well, actually it's fine, it's the same thing, it's just in a different order. But product should be improved, okay? So users get you data, data helps you improve. Once you improve the algorithm, you get more users, the users give you more data, and this is a great cycle, okay? This mountain of data is what makes you defensible. This is, this is your moat around your castle for your business, okay? No, if you have 200,000 image pairs about all these graphic designers created over two years, no Google or Facebook or Microsoft can come along and just buy you out. They can't, they can't duplicate that algorithm. They need the data that took years to acquire, okay? That's not something that money can just produce, or maybe it can, but it's way more money than it would cost for them to just buy it from you for a couple million, right? Or a couple hundred million. So this is a great cycle, strategic data acquisition. AI companies, what is an AI company? Strategic data acquisition, unified data warehouse, rampant automation, and being aware of this new and evolving job description world, right? I'm telling you from somebody who's doing it right now, talent acquisition is a very hard thing because people think that they're a data scientist or they're a data analyst, but they don't even know what these words mean. They just throw all these buzzwords on their resumes because everybody's hiring everyone who has them. And so it's a really messy market right now. So you want to make sure that you can wade your way through it carefully. And then finally, anything that a human can do in less than a second of thought, we can basically automate, right? So these are the main things that you should keep in mind when you're going out into the world, knowing how AI is influencing the industry and the market right now. And these are things that you need to be completely aware of. Questions? So, like you just said, a bunch of people are putting this on their resumes, but they don't know what they're talking about. What backgrounds of people have you found, like majors or whatever, have you found people to be the most successful, most accurate in saying that they are good at this stuff? Yeah, so here's the thing. Pretty much everyone in computer science, engineering, statistics, they're all saying data science and everything. So 
you're not going to like this, but I have found pretty much one of the least useful indicators on someone's competence is their, is their degree in their education, honestly. Um, it's just a really poor indicator. People, they don't really get out of the universities what they used to anymore, and I shouldn't be saying this. I think it's Ted would be hearing me saying this, but <laughs> let the truth be what it is, okay? You're not getting your money back. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is what it is. I mean, I'm telling you from personally, the people that I want to hire are the people who can do what I want them to do, right? And so how do you do that? Well, you make a blog, you post. So if you're a videographer, put videos on the website about what you can do. And then someone, you, okay, here's the idea, right? 50 years ago, you walk into a company and you go, you should hire me because I can do this. And then the company goes, well, how do we know you can do that? And you go, here's a piece of paper that's from this really trustworthy institution that says I know how to do this. This is my credibility uh, swag. So here, hire me. And that was the way that you communicated credibility. But the advent, uh, the advent of the internet's really kind of thrown that on its head, right? I don't need to see any pieces of paper. If, if you have a blog where you have your web, you have all of your videos that are really impressive and I can just see them there, I mean, that's way more credible than, you're basically eliminating the middleman, right? I don't need a, an institution to tell me that you know it. I can just see that you know it directly. That's, that's what you want to do. Um, so for me, the most, the people that I hire, the people that are involved in the community, they develop open source code, they go on to blogs, and they, have, they go on to uh, forums, and they answer people's questions, uh, they have their blogs demonstrate a lot of thought, and they carefully explain what they've done, they have figures and algorithms, and once I know that they can do it, those are the people that I want. So, yeah. That's the answer, sorry. <laughs> what else? Any other questions? Yeah, please, uh, let's, let's throw this I'm not box there. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Not a good thrower. So. so when you mentioned that um, any, you can automate anything that a human can basically think about in a second. So when it comes to these different like social media companies, such as like Facebook, um, Instagram, or anything like that, how does that tie into humans thinking less than a second when they're collecting all of this data um, based off of the amount of users and what they post and different things like that? Wait, do you mean automating data acquisition? Yes. Like meta data acquisition. Let me think about that for a minute. I mean, well, actually, no, I'm not sure you can automate that because. So, I mean, the, the idea is like you have an app and then you're presenting something and someone's going to click like or dislike, right? right? And all you're essentially saying is that I'm going to watch this person click like or dislike so many times that I know what they're, whether they're going to click Got like it. or dislike. Okay. Yeah, right? That that's kind of what you're saying, right? Yes. Okay. And that's done and they do that and that's how they market to you. They know. Got These it. are the types of posts that you like, and so since I know you're going to like them, I'm going to put them in front of you. And I mean, the majority of money that all of these uh, social media companies make is from advertising, targeted advertising. That's like the, the significant portion of their, their data revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And personally, I think it's great. I mean, I don't, I don't need to see ads of tampons or something like that, right? I mean, you know, maybe I, okay, for my wife or daughter, that's great. But I mean, uh, you know, if they show me something that I like, like cars or something that's really interesting, I think that that's beneficial personally. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I'm not really familiar with these terms, but um, another thing is like, so when we get into the discussion about these companies selling this da data to other companies and bigger companies, what exactly are they selling? They're selling their interests or are they selling their demographics or all of the above? It's a messy world and there's really <laughs> no exact answer for that. I mean, okay. it, it, it depends and it's all in the contracts and we deal with negotiating these subtleties all the time. Like for example, Grammarly, everyone's heard of Grammarly, right? Yes. If, you, if you read very carefully through their terms of service, they have this nice little clause in there that says, we own absolutely everything that you upload to us and we own the right to sell it to anyone for everything and anything we want to do to your data, we can do with it. And you basically give away all of your data to them. So if you're working on some nice contract or government contract and you want to proofread it, don't pass it through Grammarly because they're going to sell it to I don't know, Russian spies or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is kind of the idea is uh, the, the data that you're uploading and what you're giving, whether you're giving the data itself or just access to the data or the right to use an algorithm that trains on the data, this is all subject to you know, contract and debate and there's no real clear answer on that. It needs to be negotiated. Very good question. Yeah, we're actually dealing with that right now, honestly. Yeah. I'm a bad thrower too, so I might accidentally hit him. <laughs> I guess my, my question is, so how would you, could you just go to a company, like you have a good company and it's making a lot of money, could you just, I guess, the example with Grammarly, 
could you just go to Grammarly and say, hey, I'd like to obtain this data and I'd pay you X amount of money for it? And yeah, that works. Exactly Is that really just that simple? Like, for example, maybe I'm a book distributor and I'm going to go, hey, I'd like to know what kind of books people are writing about over the past six months. And so they'll be like, ah, well, here's all of our authors and here's all the stuff that they've been writing about. I'm going to pass it through natural language processing so I don't have to pay people to read it and summarize it for me. It'll automatically summarize it for me and tell me the topics of all the things that have been written by 6,000 authors across the world over the past six months. And now you know that 27% of people are writing about politics and Trump or something like that. And so now you make some business decision based off of the fact that authors are going to be publishing a lot of books about Trump coming up. You, know? you see what I mean? Yeah, it's a little hypothetical. Good question. What else? Good. Well, let me share one more thing with you. 